The whole point of meringue is it is a textural experience. You have that very light and crispy shell, and then you have this sort of like melt in your mouth, marshmallowy, soft, pillowy interior. That's what's good about meringue. The flavor is like whatever. Hi everyone, I'm Clara Saffitz. I'm a cookbook author. You might know my first book or my YouTube channel, both called Dessert Person. I am here today to make a new recipe from my brand new cookbook. It's called What's for Dessert? And I'm gonna show you my all-purpose meringue. It is a French meringue, so it's the easiest type of meringue to make. And this is what you'll use to create meringue cookies or pavlova or eat and mess. It has that classic crispy on the outside, marshmallowy on the inside texture. It's so delicious and it's pretty easy to make. So meringue is a very simple preparation of just egg whites and sugar. So the ingredient list is pretty short. I have eggs here, which I'm gonna separate, granulated sugar and powdered sugar. I'll talk about why I use both. And then just a little kosher salt, cream of tartar, which is a stabilizer, and some vanilla extract just to flavor the meringue. Meringue is this foam that we create from egg whites and sugar. And egg white foam is sort of inherently unstable, so the air bubbles will start to kind of pop and the thing will deflate. So making meringue is all about creating the most stable foam that we can. So the first step for meringue is separating the eggs. I'm gonna grab a large bowl for whipping the meringue. And I have right here a glass bowl. So glass or metal is preferable. You don't really wanna use a plastic bowl because any presence of fat can inhibit the whipping of the egg whites. And even a clean plastic bowl often retains like a very thin residue of fat, so it's not ideal. So glass or metal is best. Um, and I'm gonna separate the eggs one at a time. And again, that presence of fat can inhibit whipping, so we don't wanna get any yolk into our egg whites. So I'll show you my egg separating method. I mean, it's nothing, it's nothing new. Just wanna give it a little tap, and I like to separate it between the halves of the shell. And remember that cold eggs are easier to separate. The yolk is less likely to break but you wanna whip room temperature egg whites. So if you can, go ahead and separate them and then let the whites come up to room temperature. Save the yolks because the yolks are great for making a custard, a lemon curd, pastry cream, that kind of thing. So if you do end up getting a little bit of egg yolk into your egg whites, you can try to fish it out with a spoon or the eggshell, but if you feel like it's sort of streaking throughout the whites and you're not sure if you got it all, it's best to start over. And that's why it's great to separate the eggs just one by one to separate bowls so you don't like ruin the whole batch. So the next step after we have our egg whites is to start to beat them. So I'm gonna grab my hand mixer and this recipe is very makeable with a hand mixer. If you think about meringue, it's been like a part of French pastry for a long time. Wave of four stand mixer. So theoretically you could do this by hand, but six egg whites is a pretty large volume. So we're gonna use a hand mixer. So there's three basic kinds of meringue, French, Italian, and Swiss. So Italian and Swiss are a little bit more advanced. They involve like heat and sort of cooking a mixture. So we're not doing that. We're making French meringue the easiest kind where I'm just whipping everything together. I wanna to start by beating my egg whites without adding any sugar first. So I'm going to add some cream of tartar, which is an acid, it's a stabilizer. You could also use distilled white vinegar, lemon juice would work as well, and a little bit of kosher salt. So the first step is to break up the egg whites. If you notice when you crack an egg, like if it, you know, you crack it into a pan, the white kind of holds together in like a little mound. So we want to break them up and get them fluid and then we're going to start to add the sugar. It only took about 10 or 15 seconds, but you can see that the egg whites transformed from being like translucent and yellow to this frothy, foamy, opaque white mixture. So at this point, I'm gonna mix it a little bit further and once I start to have like really soft peaks and I'll show you what that looks like, I'm gonna start to add my, gran my granulated sugar. So we're sort of just under soft peaks. It's still pretty liquid, but now is a good time to start adding the sugar. You could make French meringue by combining the liquid egg whites and the sugar all at the same time in the beginning and then whipping. But by whipping the egg whites sort of until they're foamy and white first, that helps us to achieve greater volume with the meringue. I'm gonna now add the sugar, beating constantly. So the key to this step is letting the sugar sort of cascade gently into the bowl and adding it slowly. You wanna beat constantly because again, we are trying to get all of that sugar to dissolve and egg whites are mostly water. So it's that water content that will dissolve the sugar and what's happening is the proteins in the egg white are denaturing. So they're kind of like unfolding and they're linking up thanks to the sugar with the water and the sugar that I'm adding. So I'm creating this beautiful foam. I haven't quite added all the sugar, but I wanted to show you sort of what the meringue looks like at this stage. You can see that the air bubbles have gotten really, really fine, so the mixture looks sort of dense. It's getting really glossy. I would say this is really a soft peak. See how the mound kind of droops over when I lift up the beaters? 
That is a soft peak. So we're gonna continue to beat this, adding the sugar, and then I am going to turn up the mixer and beat it until I have like a super stiff glossy meringue. I'm gonna show you what a firm peak looks like. This is a medium peak, I would say. It's sort of holding its shape, but it's not standing upright. So we're gonna keep going. I've added all of the sugar at this point, and you can see we have this glossy foam. The air bubbles have become really fine, so it looks sort of dense. And what happens as we're beating the mixture and adding the sugar, the sugar is helping to stabilize the egg whites at the same time that beating is causing the proteins in the egg whites to denature. So they're kind of like unfolding and linking up with water and the air and creating this foam. So again, this is an unstable foam. So eventually the air bubbles will start to pop and then this will deflate. So we wanna work, you know, sort of all in one shot. Like it's not a good idea to like leave this and come back. So I'm gonna now continue to beat this on medium high until I have really firm peaks. I know when I'm gonna approach stiff peaks because the mixture will start to really carry the marks of the beater in like a really sharp way, so I'll be able to see that. And the advantage of a hand mixer is that you can move it around, you can work in a shallower bowl so you can really see what's going on. If you're on a stand mixer, keep in mind this is gonna happen much faster and you wanna keep a close eye because the bowl is pretty deep and so it's just easier to overbeat it. You can't actually overbeat meringue. I'm done beating the meringue. You can see I have this beautiful firm peak or stiff peak and I know it's a stiff peak because it's standing straight upright. So this is a good end point. I'm gonna do a little test to make sure all the sugar is dissolved. If the sugar isn't all dissolved, it can lead to something called weeping, which is where the water kind of like separates out from the rest of the meringue mixture and you get this kind of like puddle, syrupy puddle. So you wanna make sure all the sugar is dissolved. So I'm taking a tiny little dab on my fingertip and I just wanna rub my fingers together and feel for any grit. Okay, that feels smooth. So I'm ready to move on to the next step, which is adding our vanilla and our confectioner sugar. So I started with granulated sugar, and then the next step is to add my confectioner sugar. And the reason is because if I were to add all of that sugar as granulated sugar, I would probably end up over beating the meringue as I'm adding the sugar and getting it to dissolve. And confectioner sugar dissolves almost instantly because it's so fine, plus it has a little bit of cornstarch, which also acts as a stabilizer. So I'm gonna actually beat in my vanilla before I add my confectioner sugar. And adding the vanilla at this stage is actually kind of helpful because if you feel like you went a little bit too far in beating your meringue, the liquid from the vanilla extract helps to smooth it out a little bit. So I'm gonna add one teaspoon of vanilla extract. If you wanted to make like little meringue cookies for the holidays, you could do peppermint extract, you could do like a tiny bit of lemon extract um, to flavor them that way. So this is an opportunity to add a different flavor. I'm just gonna beat this in briefly. So now the last sort of assembly step for the meringue is to add the confectioner sugar, and I'm going to sift it in. So you can use like an actual sifter or just a fine mesh sieve, which is what I have here. So confectioner sugar has cornstarch in it as like an anti-clumping agent. Sometimes you still get little lumps. I'm just gonna get rid of these. I don't even really need to add these. It's just a tiny bit. So the next step is to use a flexible spatula to fold this mixture in gently. I'm gonna sort of start by scraping down along the side of the bowl underneath the mixture and then with a flip of the wrist, turn it over. Folding is a gentle mixing method and is really designed to like bring what's on the bottom of the bowl up to the top. So I just wanna incorporate the confectioner sugar gently and evenly. This is just about done. I'm gonna give it maybe one or two more folds, but you can see that the meringue is still really like firm and stiff. It's voluminous. It hasn't like kind of puddled out and become more fluid. And of course the sugar is completely incorporated, so I don't have any pockets of confectioner sugar. And that's all you wanna mix. At this point, you wanna avoid mixing too much because you can deflate the foam that we worked so hard to create. So French meringue, if you're not incorporating it into another preparation like a mousse or a cake, it usually gets baked. Although baked is not really the way to look at it, it gets dried. So that foam, as I said, is not as stable as a Swiss meringue or an Italian meringue. So in order to sort of maintain that texture of the meringue, we need to dry it out. So you generally bake meringue at a really low temperature. So I'm gonna preheat the oven to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. No, did I just turn it off? Oh God, hold on, hold on, I can do it. Did it, okay. <laughs> so I'm making a pavlova with this meringue. I keep saying pavlova, I don't know if you know what a pavlova is, but I will explain it. So pavlova is, Actually, it's a controversial dessert because there is sort of disputed origins. Some people say it's from New Zealand, some people say it's from Australia, but it is basically a sort of bed of crispy on the outside, marshmallowy on the inside meringue, topped with whipped cream, 
and a fruit topping. So the traditional topping is passion fruit, which is so delicious, but you can really do any kind of fruit topping you like. What I like about pavlova is it takes these sort of non-sweet components, puts them on top of the meringue, and it's this really like incredible sort of textural dessert, plus you get the contrast between the sweet meringue and the unsweetened cream and the sort of tart fruit on top. So I have here a rim baking sheet with some parchment paper on it. I am going to scrape out the meringue completely onto my parchment paper. The traditional shape for pavlova is usually round and it's kind of this like tall, kind of like bulbous meringue bed. I like to do a kind of thinner application of the meringue because it is so sweet. I like that greater surface area so that you have a higher proportion of that topping to meringue, just better balanced in the final dessert. So I'm gonna kind of form it with the back of a spoon into a kind of rough rectangle for pavlova. You could do any shape that you like. With this style of meringue, because it is so stiff, you could pipe it into like a really defined shape. You can get like a star tip and get beautiful kind of lines. But to me, it's so voluminous and billowy that I like when you can see that natural texture. So I go in with a spoon and create kind of natural peaks and valleys, swooshes and swirls, and then that creates like little areas for all the cream and fruit to fill in. So what happens in the oven, even though we're baking at a really low temp, the tiny little air bubbles in the meringue will puff slightly because they're warming up. So we, I will get some sort of overall like expansion of the meringue a bit. I'm only mentioning that because it, I think that you want to kind of make deeper valleys than you might think initially because I want that like varied depth of the meringue. I mean, I'm not going straight through to the sheet tray, but I am making sure to create some thicker and thinner areas. And then in those thicker spots, that's where the interior of the meringue will stay really marshmallowy and soft and the whole exterior will get incredibly crisp and like light, like a shell. So I'm gonna get this into the oven. And this takes a while to dry. So I have kind of a lot of meringue here. So there's lots of moisture in here that needs to basically be driven off. So this is gonna bake for a couple of hours. This is not gonna take on any color. That's partly why we're baking it at so low of temperature. There's so much sugar in here. So if you bake it higher, it will start to turn golden. We just want it to stay completely white and it's going to dry out. So you know that the meringue is done when not only is the surface going to be dry to the touch and crisp, but you should be able to peel the meringue off of the parchment paper. If it starts to stick in any places, that means it's not done yet. Let it bake longer. And because we want the whole pavlova to dry out at the same rate, I'm gonna also rotate the pan 180 degrees, so just like side to side, after about an hour. What I love about pavlova is it is a meringue-based dessert, but it is also a fruit dessert. So it's an opportunity to make good use of whatever seasonal fruit you have around. So these are some actually quite large ripe figs. So this will be a nice accompaniment. Sometimes with fruit, I might roast it or cook it somehow. Oftentimes that is because I want to sort of control the amount of moisture, so I might be like reducing the juices or that kind of thing. But for these figs, because they're ripe, I think I'm just gonna leave them uncooked, but I'm going to do a step called macerating. So that's a technique I cover in the book. It is a very s sort of simple operation where you're just mixing fruit with a little bit of sugar and often a little bit of liquid, so in this case, some lemon juice. And I'm just gonna let it sit and it will soften the fruit, draw out some of the juices because what I also want on the pavlova is some like nice drips of the fruit juices over the cream. So I'm just gonna slice them. They look so pretty. I love seeing that cross section. And now I'm going to macerate them. So I'm adding some sugar. The purpose of the sugar is not really to sweeten everything because figs are already sweet. It's really to draw out the juices. So sugar is hydroscopic. It like will pull water from the environment. So I'm just gonna sprinkle, this is two tablespoons of sugar. I don't even think I'm gonna sprinkle all of it on there. I might just wanna do a light coating of sugar on everything. And then I'm gonna squeeze some lemon juice on top. And one of these lemons I'm gonna save because I think I'll do some fresh lemon zest on the pavlova at the end. So obviously the lemon is gonna kind of facilitate the maceration, but I also want all of those tart flavors. So sugar and acid are flavor enhancers. So these are going to bring out the flavors of the figs and complement it really well. Using clean hands, I'm just gonna toss everything gently because I don't, the figs are ripe, so they're a little bit soft, so I don't wanna break them up very much. Just wanna get everything coated. So I wanna let this sit at room temperature. The sugar is gonna draw out the juices and I'm gonna get some nice sort of syrupy liquid in the bottom. And then I'm gonna check on my meringue. I already have the cream whipped, so if that's ready, we can go into assembly. The pavlova base, the meringue, has been baking for nearly two and a half hours. The range is about two to two and a half, depending on your oven. And once it was done, I checked for the peeling away of the parchment paper, and I'll show you. But I turned off the oven, and then I let the pavlova cool with the door propped open. So I have a wooden spoon here just to get the door open, and that is to sort of gently and slowly allow any remaining moisture in the oven to escape, and it just sort of ensures that you have 
the sort of crisp texture that I want for the meringue. But actually it's cool, so I can grab it. That's the nice thing about baking something at 200 is nothing ever gets terribly hot. The meringue looks great. It is firm to the touch and dry everywhere. I see little cracks here and there. That's very normal. That's sort of a, a normal part of the drying process as it's baking in the oven. So I'm gonna show you how you know that it's done. When you lift up the meringue, and the whole thing is just pretty sturdy, the parchment should peel away cleanly. So if the parchment were to have picked up and like pulled away pieces of the meringue, that just means it's not done baking. So the bottom is also dry. You see I have like little tiny patches of some sort of syrupy. That's actually really normal. It's not uncommon to see like little tiny beads of moisture like that, but overall the meringue did not weep. It looks really great. If you have like big sort of pools of that all over your baking sheet, it just means that you probably didn't fully dissolve your sugar. So be longer next time. But when I press down into the center, I, I hit like a marshmallowy interior. So that's exactly what we want. That was so satisfying. The whole point of meringue is it is a textural experience. You have that very light and crispy shell, and then you have this sort of like melt in your mouth, marshmallowy, soft, pillowy interior. That's what's good about meringue. The flavor is like whatever. really kind of want to just nibble on this outside piece of meringue. But you can see it's like crispy, it has some of that marshmallow interior. I like to drag it through the cream. I just love how you get the kind of like soft but really crispy crunch of the meringue and then it kind of gives way to that like even slightly chewy but still kind of dissolve in your mouth texture. I love it with the fresh figs because it brings the kind of like fruity brightness. We have that little bit of lemon juice, which enlivens everything. Really the point is that it's this textural experience with the meringue on the bottom. All right, so I hope you enjoyed watching my technique for all-purpose meringue. For a pavlova recipe, you can find that in my book, What's for Dessert? And for more dessert recipes, you can go to delish.com.